Welcome everyone to our weekly celebration of service for April 20th, 2021. I'm your current president, Ashley Wesley. Thank you for being here. Natalie, please show the flag for 15 seconds of respectful silence. We ask that you remain on mute and take this time to personally reflect. Flag. Is everyone still there? We're here. I apologize. My Zoom just said it crashed unexpectedly and I was in a panic. Uh -oh. um, I apologize for that. Is my screen sharing? It we did, we, we never, never saw the. It never shared. I, I apologize. Something's going on. Hmm. It's blacking it out. Um, it's Zoom censorship. That's what it is. Something is truly <laughs> happening. I apologize. I, Let I me see a beautiful woman. <laughs> <laughs> I keep hitting share, but it's not showing my screen. I don't my know what is. I, I don't know what is happening. Well, we hope we all uh, imagine the flag anyway, and that's right. Can lead us forward. Yes, we'll we'll thank move you. on. And we'll have a, a graphic <laughs> next week. Um, okay. Thank you. Now, I'd like to introduce Charlotte Zitlow, who will be offering our reflection today. Charlotte. Can you hear me now? Yes. Okay. I'm going to reflect today on Rotary. And what I, the part of Rotary that I'm going to reflect on is scholarships. Because Rotary, Rotary for me is, is a lot of things, but what I, one of the things I value very much about Rotary is, is our international nature, this thing that we're dedicated to international peace. And also we're, we do a great deal for, for young people. My children were one of my my daughter was a Rotary Youth Exchange person, which which changed her life. She spent a year in Brazil. It was it changed her life, and we had a Brazilian, an Australian woman living with us, who I'm still in touch with since 1976. But but I'm going to talk about the Rotary Scholarship Program, because it's a huge part of what we do, and we don't talk about it often enough. Today I'm going to go go be part of a, a selection process to to get scholarships for high school students. But you, on your screen now, these are four uh, four global global grant scholars, as you see, and that's a big deal. We our our club has sponsored four four. Global Grant Scholars. These are huge scholarships. They're forty thousand dollars, which is a bunch even today. And the first person that we sent to England was Aubrey Cedar, who who was working on, who is actually working on trying to create peace through act, uh, through art, through, through through performances and and music and so forth. Can you hear me? There's feedback. I don't like that. And then we have, we, we sent Alex Starry, who from Bloomington, who, who went to Berlin to study economics and so forth. She got her degree there and she's still in Berlin because she also learned to know a German, a German as well as German. But she's, she's also working in a not-for-profit not organization, an NGO in Germany to, to, to working on peace. And right now we have Clarice Cross, who, whose mother is Japanese, but she's from Brownsburg and she's in Tokyo. And we can, we'll be, she'll be speaking tomorrow at the Clarksville Club, but she's, she's doing another project on uh, peace and economics and international understanding. And, and the, we've just learned that, that Cameron Davidson from Salem, Indiana, Little Salem, is going to go to Salamanca in Spain next year and study international inter relationships and so forth. Salamanca is the oldest university in, the, in, in Europe. 
So we're very lucky. I, I, don't, I don't believe there's another, another um, club that, that has sent four, four scholars in a row. We're, and, I, and I want to say thank you we, to Jim Bright for, for making sure that that's happened because he's been very instrumental in, in, in nursing their, their applications through these, the multiple groups that, that, that they've had to go through to attain this. But those are huge scholarships and the, these people will go out and do us proud in the world and work on international peace. But this afternoon as well, uh, Matt Sitzinger is, is um, chairing the youth scholarships <clears throat> where we will be talking to four students from local high schools, six, six students from local high schools and selecting four of those students to, um, to give us, to do, we don't have anything like $40,000, I think it's 1500 right now, but it's still an honor and it's some money to help them to, into their school future. So we're going to be talking what is for scholarships. And this is this is a group that that Byron Bangard spent many, many years chairing and Matt Stitzinger has taken it over so that Byron doesn't have to email hundreds of pages of, of applications anymore. But it, it for me this is a very fulfilling part of of Rotary and I love it and I've worked my way. I've really asked to be on these committees because even though it's a fair amount of work for a few short time, it's, you, you talk to people, young people, and you find out that their aspirations for, for a peaceful, good world are, are out there and there are a lot of them and they, they are smart and they're, they're, they're hardworking and they're, they're inter enterprising and they're going to do. They're going to help help us in making this world a better place. And and the, especially the, the high school students are so enthusiastic about in, environmental issues, and um, you know, and you know the issues of of gun control and and things like that. These are people who are going to make a difference because. And so it's it's been for me a very very wonderful opportunity. And, and we should all be proud and aware of the, of the work that we do as a Rotary Club to get these young people out into the world, make, improving it and making it better for our children. So thank you. Thank, thank you all in Rotary for helping support these things. I think they're one of the best things we do. And I'm really lucky to be part, part of it. So thank you for that too, okay. Thank you, Charlotte. And we were reminded, uh, Susie Graham brought to her attention to mention that three Ivy Tech students also received scholarship assistance from us. Here. That's right, that's right. We fund many uh, initiatives for these people to make a difference in the world. It is so crucial to what we do. So thank you for reminding us about that today, Charlotte. Yes, I think it's the sun. And Ryla, we also do Ryla, the Rotary Youth Le Leadership. Is For students in high school currently. So there's a lot of education support going on and it's, it's so crucial to these students. So proud to be able to offer that. Yes. All right, and uh, Charlotte also mentioned that Clarice Cross will be speaking at Clarksville Rotary tomorrow morning. If anyone wants to wake up bright and early and join them at 7.30 a.m., you're welcome to hop on the Zoom and hear Clarice speak. And I, I can share that Zoom link with anyone who's interested if you just let me know in okay. the chat or send me a message, we'll forward it along. Okay, thank you. All right, um, thank you so much. Let's move on to introduce any guests, which I don't believe we have any, but let me do a final check here on my screen. I don't think we have any guests with us today. Am I missing anyone? All right. Well, welcome to all of you. So glad that our whole Rotary family can be here and join us every week on Zoom. Soon enough, we will be back in person. We can't wait for that moment. <laughs> all right, thanks to our producers, Natalie Blaze, Michael Shermis, and Aaron Davis today for helping us make this run smoothly. And a roundabout reporter this week is Sarah Laughlin newly back from her vacation. Welcome back, Sarah. 
We have a few birthdays to celebrate. Joe Darling is today. Peggy Frisbee is April 21st. Mike Baker is April 23rd. Connie Shikalis is April 23rd. And Glenn Steenberger is April 26th. Happy birthday to all of you. And now we have an announcement from our foundation chair, Mike Baker. Take it away, Mike. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, I'm officially calling our annual meeting of the Bloomington Rotary Foundation uh, and our club uh, as of today. It's, uh, annually, we sort of give an updated report on our foundation. As you know, our Bloomington Rotary Foundation manages the money from things like the toast, donations we get, uh, the 80-20 donations, uh, I call them uh, bereavement uh, donations where people pledge so much. If there's a Rotarian who passes, then this, it's a way of honoring them and that money is automatically deducted. Those monies um, go towards scholarships. That's one of the things the foundation does. So to give you just a brief update, um, our foundation right now has over $93,000 in it. 71,162 of it really is our club's money. The difference between the two is we carry a positive balance uh, money for both the Sunrise and North Club, mostly from the toast proceeds. Um, and then when they have a need for a matching grant or determine a charitable um, uh, opportunity to give, then they will withdraw that money. So we're setting at, uh, again, 71,000. Um, and we still are carrying a balance from uh, the last um, toast of around 10,000. So we're doing good financially. Um, also, as part of our annual meeting, I want to uh, thank some board members that are stepping off. And that would be uh, Craig Spence and Joy Harder. Sorry about the phone. It's probably a crank call. Um, I also want to... Um, mentioned that uh, we have an election every year of uh, new officers. Um, so this year, the slate of officers as voted on by our current board uh, would start July 1st would be President Sarah Laughlin, Vice President Lauren Snyder, Treasurer Kyla cox Deckard, Secretary Ashley Wesley. And um, Natalie will send out a um, survey, if you will, a um, survey monkey, and ask for each of you to vote the either for that board. And if it's nay, the need to say that. And if you have any recommendations, also send me that. But that's the process that we go through. The board members that will be serving for this uh, new year will be myself, Katie Crookshank, Alon Barker has agreed to join us, Katie Beck. Jim Capshu and Gil Souza, who are members from last year. Amy Osajima has agreed. And just a few minutes ago, I worked really hard, but John Vanderzee said he would agree to, to, uh, to join us on the board. So we've got a, a well-versed board. Our job is to manage the money, look over it. Um, another thing that we discussed, um, again, our current policy, one of our 80-20 uh, deals that people can sign up for, um, is that if there's a Rotarian who passes uh, during the year, uh, you would automatically pledge that you would donate $20, which goes into our, our scholarship fund um, in recognition of that person. We also discussed recognizing, uh, being able to use the Rory Foundation as a way to recognize spouses of Rotarians and actually other family members. And so rather than changing our bylaws to try to reflect that, it'll be up to uh, one of the officers of our foundation, should there be a passing of, of someone or, or any of you feel like there is a, um, um, someone that you would like to honor through a donation to our foundation, we were gonna make sure that it's, it's open for those kinds of donations as well. Um, let me see, I think, I think that's it. If anyone has any questions about our finances, how the foundation works, or anything else, please email me at any time about it. I want to thank those that have stepped up to serve uh, this coming year. And again, you should be getting something from Natalie to vote on the proposed slate of officers 
for next year. I think that covers it. Thank you. Thank you so much. And sincere thanks to our newest members who will be joining. Uh, so, so glad when people step up and join one of our leadership uh, positions in Rotary. It's wonderful to see things from that perspective. And I, I just really appreciate each of you for joining. All right, we have a few announcements. Um, the Solidarity Sleepout is coming up on April 30th. It's Beacon's uh, annual event to support a friend's place, which is an overnight shelter. And Von Welch, one of our own Rotarians is participating. So you can hop over to their donation page to give and to support that. And it would be much appreciated. It was good to see Joy Harder, Alon Barker, Sally Gaskell, Owen Johnson, Jim Bright, Raj Shadawi, and Kate Cruikshank at the district conference on Saturday. Love seeing you on the Zoom screen. We had several wonderful speakers. We learned about um, diversity and inclusion. We learned about uh, the foundation and, and other things. And it was a really interesting day to spend together, short and sweet and to the point. So I encourage anyone who did not attend to look at that next year and it, it'll be in person, I believe. Uh, it's always a great time to see things from a district perspective and learn a little bit more about Rotary as an international organization. So thanks to all of you that attended. And I have a note from the MCCSC School of uh, the Board of the School Trustees uh, regarding Dr. Judy DeMuth's retirement. I wanted to pass it along to all of you because in lieu of a retirement farewell reception because of the current health restrictions that we have, they're planning to give Dr. DeMuth a book of gratitude and a private celebration. And that's where we come in. If you would send a note, a card or a letter or an email to MCCSC, and I'll have the in, uh, address for you in the roundabout, and I'll put it in the chat as well, by Friday, May 7th, it will be included in that booklet of, of gratitude for Judy, uh, celebrating her many years of service for the school as the superintendent, and it would be much appreciated. So again, that is by Friday, May 7th. I will put the address uh, and email address into the chat and well, it'll be in the roundabout as well. All right, uh, time for some happy dollars. Anyone have any happy moments to share? Hal Turner. Yes, I'm sharing $5 in honor of the residents of Boston who 246 years ago today were put under the uh, British uh, siege of Boston, which lasted for 11 months, but it was one of the pivotal issues of the uh, Revolutionary War. And uh, the British actually left uh, for Nova Scotia after that. And it was, um, it was a very important aspect. The, the, the British blockade was uh, backfired terribly on them because the Americans kept both uh, uh, goods by land and goods by sea from reaching the British troops, which is a big reason that they left. So $5 today in honor of the Bostonians and to honor them today, I had Boston beans for lunch. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Al. Jim Bright, did I see your hand up? Yeah, thank you, President Ashley. Um, I'd like to uh, pledge $20 in celebration of the 90th birthday of Congressman Lee Hamilton. Uh, Congressman Lee Hamilton turns 90 years old today, still super sharp, and we hope to get him in here soon as a, uh, as a speaker. He hasn't spoken to us for eight or 10 years or so. Yeah. Great. Martha Foster. Yes, hi. I want to just uh, briefly follow up on uh, Charlotte's uh, reflection about what an incredible, wonderful organization this is. And I have 10 happy dollars for uh, the silver linings that have come from, the, uh, from moving to Zoom for this year. And that is uh, that we can have uh, uh, members of our club like Dr. Raj Hadawi, who are no longer in Bloomington, but can still be part of our club. I'm just very delighted with that. So go Rotary. Yay. <laughs> 
Alon Barker, you're next. Yeah, so I'm. Uh, this this past weekend was a was a sort of a bit of a shock to the system when I realized that there was this absolutely terrifying fire in Cape Town. I don't know if some of you were aware of this, but there was a fire that that overcame the campus of my alma mater, University of Cape Town, and. Uh, it just reminded me of, first of all, the um, heroism and 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 um, how extraordinary communities are when a tragedy strikes. Um, and Bloomington obviously is is one of those communities that I've come to love and to see in times of of challenge. Um, and the extraordinary thing about it was was the sense of of being transported back to a community that I felt part of. Um, but also the recognition that we are already in one big world these days, uh, more and more so. And through technology and communication, we're able to share that. So Rotary being an international organization, likewise, um, is is part of that world. So I just wanted to say my horizons were sort of expanded once again um, this weekend. I will add another $10 in honor of Cape Downs Library, I saw the pictures and I was horrified. And I think we saw the, the same steps that you showed us that you had had, had been on when you made your, your uh, protests back, way back when. Is that not right, Ellen? That's right, yeah. It was where it all happened. Yeah. So anyway, to, in, in, in honor of Cape Town, I hope they save the, the, those, the old Yeah, it's a it's a big tragedy. But I want to quickly say that um, not all of their holdings were lost. That there were there are actually three buildings that the library is housed in, and so um, one of the buildings went. But there's still a lot of there's a lot of history that's preserved at the University of Cape Town, which is good news. Raj, were you did you have a, a happy dollar to share? You're muted. I put $25 for the good in you was following the bad news. My granddaughter, who is sophomore in high school, has been signed up for a course of her study in the wilderness of Colorado Mountains. 46 students, and she is one of the half a dozen of them caught coronavirus disease. Mm -hmm. She was isolated for 10 days. She is recovering well, and I'm very grateful for the news. Thank you for sharing. I would also like to, uh, contribute five, do five happy dollars um, in order, in honor of Natalie Blaze's new granddaughter. <laughs> Awesome. Congratulations. Thanks, Becky. <laughs> I can't wait for you to meet her. Me too. All right. Any other happy dollars to share? Okay. Thank you, everyone, for sharing. And let's not delay any longer. Leslie Green will introduce our speaker for today. Hi, thank you, Ashley. I'm very excited to introduce you all to Dr. Burns, who is an adjunct professor, associate professor at Northwestern University's Master of Science in Energy and Sustainability program. He's published more than 80 articles and chapters in law, science, and policy journals and books. He is also the co-direct executive director and professor of Practice Institute for the Carbon Renewal removal, law, and policy at American University. His current areas of research focus on climate geoengineering, climate loss and damage, and the effectiveness of the European Union's emissions trading system. So I had heard about the Trillion Trees Initiative and found it quite fascinating and wanted to know more about it and wanted to find someone who has that expertise and Google provided. So <laughs> I've never personally met uh, Dr. Burns, but I'm very excited to have him here with us 
remotely today to, to learn more about this interesting initiative. All right. Thank you for thank you very much, Leslie, and uh, uh, thank you for inviting me to uh, uh, to speak in front of Rotary. I, I think Rotary is just a wonderful organization. Uh, not only does it uh, celebrate local community, but as a number of you have emphasized, it 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 uh, celebrates uh, uh, global community, right? And our inter interdependence with, with others. And I think the opportunities that are provided in terms of scholarships often uh, are transformative for young people who are exposed to different cultures and different perspectives. And also um, in, in many ways project the, the best of, of America to, to others in the world. So, um, I think it's uh, the the work you do is wonderful. So, uh, with that, I'll I'll talk a little bit about uh, this concept of, of of a trillion trees, and then leave some time for uh, for questions. So, let me frame the reason that we're even talking about the idea of planting massive amounts of of trees, at least when it comes to climate policy. So. Um, as you all know, we have this international agreement called the uh, the Paris Agreement, and the idea of the Paris Agreement is for countries to make pledges to uh, reduce their emissions of uh, of greenhouse gases, carbon dioxide, methane, nitrous oxides, enough that we can hold temperatures to below two degrees Celsius, it's about 3.7 degrees uh, Fahrenheit, and at least aspire to hold temperatures to below 1.5 degrees Celsius by the year 2100. And these numbers weren't just plucked out of the, uh, the ether. Uh, what climate scientists have told us is that when temperatures increase by more than two degrees uh, Celsius, uh, some of the most serious implications of climate change are likely to manifest themselves. Ma massive losses of biodiversity, uh, massive sea level that could result in flooding of huge swaths of, of areas, including small island states and, and low-lying uh, coastal areas in places like Egypt and Bangladesh and the United States. Uh, and uh, massive uh, increases in disease, uh, uh, deaths related to heat and so forth. And so uh, this agreement seeks to ensure that we don't pass those critical uh, temperature uh, thresholds. But what we found in recent years is that the pledges that countries have made to reduce their emissions are not nearly enough to hold temperatures to below two degrees Celsius by the end of the century, much less 1.5 degrees Celsius. Uh, some of the recent studies say that uh, uh, the pledges that have been made to date to reduce emissions put us on track for temperature increases of somewhere between three to 3.7 degrees Celsius by the end of the century, and temperatures could continue to rise uh, for hundreds of years after that because of the inertia in the system. Uh, and these kind of temperature increases could be catastrophic. Uh, if temperatures rise three degrees Celsius, you could uh, have massive melting of polar ice caps, which could result in, in, in huge increases in sea level. You could lose 40 to 50% of the species on Earth. Uh, you could have huge economic impacts, right? So uh, it, it, clearly we do not want to uh, pass uh, the two degrees Celsius threshold, but when we start talking about three and four degrees Celsius, um, it, it becomes incomprehensible. So as a consequence, in recent years, there's been discussion of another way to respond to climate change to help us to not pass these temperature thresholds. And these are called, in a, in a broad sense, carbon dioxide removal options. So the idea here is not only to reduce our emissions so that we're uh, spewing fewer uh, greenhouse gases into the atmosphere, but to try to remove some of the carbon dioxide that's already resonant in the atmosphere. And the idea is, is that if you remove some of that carbon dioxide, there's less of it to trap the outgoing radiation, right, that's emanated from the sun, hit Earth, and is uh, heading back to uh, space. It reduces the amount of uh, greenhouse gases that can trap that radiation, and it exerts a cooling impact. And most scientists now believe that if we're going to have a chance 
of avoiding uh, temperature increases of more than two degrees Celsius, not only are we going to have to aggressively decarbonize our economy, right? Try to move to uh, renewables as quickly as we can in virtually every sector of our economy and increase energy efficiency, but we're also going to have to deploy these carbon dioxide removal uh, options at a very large scale. Uh, some recent scientific studies have indicated that to hold temperatures to below two degrees Celsius, not only are we going to have to uh, accelerate our reductions of emissions, but we're going to have to sequester somewhere between 10 to 20 gigatons, that's billion tons of carbon dioxide from the atmosphere every year uh, th uh, to, through the end of the century. And overall, somewhere around a thousand uh, gigatons, so a trillion tons of carbon dioxide are going to have to be removed from the atmosphere. So how are we gonna do that? Well, there's been various uh, uh, options that have been discussed um, I'll talk about some of the other options at the end, uh, but one that has been e extensively discussed uh, in recent years is planting trees, right? The idea is, is that when you plant trees, they take up carbon dioxide, uh, they use them for photosynthesis, and they, they, it, as a consequence, uh, reduces the amount of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. So there have been studies in recent years that have indicated that if we were to plant uh, a massive amount of trees, uh, it could take up substantial amounts of carbon dioxide. Uh, one recent study, the one that cited the most of, by proponents of this approach, uh, indicated that if we were to increase tree cover on Earth by about 25%, uh, it could remove 25% of the carbon dioxide from the atmosphere. Okay, and that would have a dramatic effect in terms of, of holding temperatures to below two degrees Celsius. As a consequence, at the international level, we've had initiatives by the uh, International Monetary Fund, the World Bank, and others to create what's called the Trillion Trees Initiative, to plant a trillion trees uh, that would uh, essentially get us to that 25% forest cover. Uh, and uh, U.S. policymakers have also uh, looked at this approach and have sought to support it. Uh, yeah, Senators Braun and Young uh, in Indiana uh, uh, have co-sponsored a bill uh, with two Democratic senators, and how often do you hear that these days, uh, that would uh, uh, seek to provide U.S. support for this International Trillion Trees Initiative. Uh, former President Trump uh, also uh, supported uh, this Trillion Trees Initiative and assigned an executive order uh, that sought to provide uh, funding and other support uh, for this effort. Unfortunately, um, I think there are, uh, there are various uh, uh, issues associated with uh, uh, looking at, at, at an initiative of this nature, and that's what I want to discuss. Uh, the argument that I made in uh, in the editorial that I published in the uh, Indianapolis Tribune recently was that while planting trees can provide some of the solution in terms of uh, carbon removal, it, it can't by any means be the primary way that we do that. Uh, and, and I just want to outline some of the reasons that I think that's true and then make a few suggestions of other things that we can do uh, to uh, uh, to try to help in terms of climate change uh, more generally, and then carbon removal more uh, specifically. Um, so the first issue with uh, this idea of planting uh, a trillion trees uh, is that there's there's methodological issues. There's problems wrong. Uh, there's the problems with the studies that have indicated that you could plant a trillion trees and that it would reduce the amount of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere by a, a quarter or more. Uh, the primary issue with this is that most of those studies ignore the fact that if you're going to plant trees in, uh, in areas uh, that are already sequestering substantial amounts of carbon, you have to take into account that that carbon uh, will, be, will be lost when you, uh, when you engage in that tree planting. Uh, one recent study said that in the areas in which we're seeking to, uh, uh, that we're targeting for uh, tree planting, often uh, grasslands and uh, areas of this nature, 
um, store substantial amounts of carbon dioxide already. And so if you plant trees in those areas, uh, you will take up more carbon in the trees, but you'll lose all the carbon in converting those, those areas. And those studies indicate that that means that we may be overestimating the amount of sequestration of carbon by about 85%, right? So that's a big deal, okay? Um, and again, is not often taken into account in these studies. Another thing that's not taken into account in these studies is something called changes in, in surface albedo. So when we look at where we would be targeting tree planting, um, about 25% of all of the trees that would be planted, it's contemplated, would be in northern regions, so-called boreal regions, often areas uh, that uh, are characterized by snow and ice. And one of the reasons that we're uh, targeting areas like that, like the, the Siberian steppes, for example, is that there's not a lot of land conflicts in those areas, right? So people aren't uh, using those areas for other things. And so people say it's logical to try to plant trees in, in those areas. The problem is, is that when you plant trees in those areas, you do take up more carbon dioxide, right? The trees are there, they're taking in CO2 for photosynthesis. But at the same time, uh, you've decreased the reflectivity of the surfaces of that land, right? Ice is highly reflective. It has what we call a high albedo, meaning that when the incoming solar radiation hits Earth, because those areas are so reflective, ice-covered surfaces, it deflects a lot of that radiation back into space, and that exerts a cooling impact, right? By contrast, uh, if you plant trees, uh, trees uh, uh, have low albedo, meaning they absorb a lot more of the incoming solar radiation. And as a consequence, that warms the Earth's surfaces, okay? So some recent studies have said that if you're planting trees in Boreal, in northern regions that are covered by ice and snow, uh, because of the increased absorption of incoming solar radiation that doesn't then get reflected back into space, uh, it might offset all of the benefits of planting the trees, or you might even get a net increase in warming, okay? Um, and that's science that has to be taken into account. And a lot of the studies that talk about planting trees assess the benefits of taking in more carbon dioxide, but they don't take into account the decrease in reflectivity of those surfaces. So that's, that's something that's extremely important. Um, Another uh, issue associated with tree planting programs is that a lot of them would displace agricultural areas. Uh, and um, a lot of those areas that are so-called marginal agricultural lands are areas that are being targeted for, uh, for tree planting. However, if you do that um, and you still need the same amount of agricultural production, which there's no reason to believe you don't, it means that that agricultural production moves to other areas. And so you, of course, you have to uh, clear away forests or grasslands or other areas uh, for uh, more agricultural crop production. And when you do that, again, you release carbon dioxide. And many of the studies, uh, again, don't take into account what happens uh, with, with that. And that's what we call leakage, right? Simply that the carbon dioxide uh, uh, releases are leaking to other areas because of the, the actions that, that we've uh, uh, taken. A second uh, issue associated with planting trees is, uh, is the issue of permanence. If you plant trees, are you getting sequestration of carbon for a long time, right? For this to matter, you need sequestration of carbon for 30, 40, 50 years or more, okay? The problem is, is that uh, recent studies have indicated that at least 50% uh, of trees are in areas that, we, that are prone to what we call stand replacing disturbances. Um, what are some of these things that might kill trees? Well, one of them is climate change, right? As, as, the, as the climate gets warmer, uh, we've seen a proliferation of forest fires, right? We've seen this in California, right, at a massive scale in recent years. In Australia, uh, in those areas, for example, if, if you take California and Oregon, uh, the forest fires in California 
uh, made trees uh, what we call a net source of carbon, right? More carbon was being released uh, than was being taken in by those trees as, as they were burnt. And as the temperatures continue to increase, the studies indicate that there's going to be increases in forest fires. And so the question is, can we rely on planting trees as a long-term source of, of storage of carbon? The other thing that's happening because of climate change is the proliferation of pests uh, that can kill trees, such as bark beetles. Uh, and we've seen uh, in many parts of the uh, world that where we've planted trees, uh, uh, bark beetle uh, proliferation associated with the increasing temperatures are killing huge stands of trees. And so again, uh, tree planting uh, may not create the kind of permanent sequestration of carbon uh, that's going to be necessary if we're going to hold temperatures to, to below two degrees Celsius. Planting trees can also have serious environmental and social justice implications in some areas. For example, um, about 50% of where we're looking to plant trees are savannas and prairie grasslands. And what we're usually looking to do when we plant trees is plant monocultural trees, like eucalyptus trees that are fast growing, right? Because we're trying to su su uh, suck up a lot of carbon and we don't wanna make the tree stands very complicated because that makes management more complicated, right? So uh, what we're looking to do is take out a lot of savannas, prairie grasslands, including in areas like Africa uh, to plant uh, these monocultural sort of uh, uh, tree stands. The problem with that is that savannas and grasslands hold huge amounts of biodiversity. And a lot of that biodiversity would be lost. And monocultural tree stands are not, by definition, very good for biodiversity. Uh, and this could further undercut um, the biodiversity in some of the, uh, uh, the, the bio hotspots of the world, again, such as Southern Africa. Um, we also uh, have seen in those areas uh, that tree planting can take huge amounts of water uh, in areas uh, that are already water poor and are gonna need more water in the future as populations uh, uh, proliferate. We also worry about land grabs. Uh, if we need huge amounts of areas, uh, if you're going to increase the uh, uh, area of, of trees by 25%, you're talking about an, a land area that's equivalent to half the size of the African continent. OK, uh, and one of the things that we're worried about is that uh, people who especially indigenous peoples that rely on certain areas for their livelihoods will be expelled in those areas as people try to plant trees and earn credits so they can sell uh, on the on the voluntary carbon markets. For example, uh, companies like Microsoft and Apple and United uh, are now buying uh, cr uh, tree credits. Right. Uh, and. Uh, there's going to be people that are going to make money by planting those trees. And some of them may do it by simply displacing people uh, from those areas. And, and we've seen some of this happen in the past, and we're worried about it uh, uh, in, uh, in this context uh, uh, also. So when we look at all of these factors uh, and we start to ask ourselves, uh, how much carbon can we sequester sustainably and in a way that doesn't uh, create these kind of social justice threats, uh, the, the numbers go down a lot. Uh, recent studies have said that at the most, we can probably sequester somewhere between one to two gigatons or billion tons of carbon a year uh, with the amount of trees that we can plant sustainably, okay? Um, uh, to put that in perspective, that would decrease temperatures by about 0.25 to 0.45 degrees Celsius, right? So it's something, right? Um, and um, and it's, it's definitely should be part of the mix that we're looking at, but it can't be the entire story, right? If we know now as a society that we need to sequester 10 to 20 billion tons a year and trees can only give us one to two, uh, then there's lots of other things that we need to do, right? And so that's the last thing I want to talk about very briefly. What else should we be doing? Well, the first thing, obviously, before we get to carbon removal, is we need to increase our uh, decarbonization of the economy and, and, and do it far more aggressively. Um, there's uh, 
there's plenty of things that uh, that could be done uh, that that we simply aren't doing right. We can uh, accelerate electrification of of parts of the economy. We can substantially increase fuel efficiency, um, and that has to be uh, uh, job one, even before we look at at carbon removal. Um, in the context of carbon removal, when it comes to trees, uh, we there's a couple of things that need to guide uh, any tree planting initiative, including the the trillion trees bill that uh, that that the senators from Indiana have introduced. Uh, one is that tree planting initiatives have to have, uh, not target uh, savannas and and uh, and prairie grasslands. Right, we have to uh, ensure that certain areas are, are preserved because of the other ecosystem benefits that they provide. Uh, we also shouldn't be targeting boreal regions, again, because uh, the increased absorption of solar radiation is going to take out most of the, of the benefits. And we just have to acknowledge that. Um, tree planting programs also should focus on the planting of mixed native species, right? We should try to preserve biodiversity in areas and not simply uh, uh, develop monocultural plantations that uh, denude areas of biodiversity and often take a lot more water. Uh, that can be a more expensive proposition than simply going in and planting a bunch of eucalyptus. Uh, but from a standpoint of the ecosystems and justice, uh, it, it, it makes sense. Um, when we think about pl tree planting, we should be thinking creatively about the role of agroforestry. Agroforestry is planting trees in agricultural areas, planting trees between crops, for example, or in, uh, uh, in grazing lands. Um, in those areas, uh, it can not only not increase the amount of land that has to be utilized, but it can provide co-benefits for farmers because it can uh, make their econ economics more resilient, right? They can rely on uh, fruit and uh, wood from those uh, products uh, to, to help them, especially in times where they might face drought in terms of their uh, crops. Uh, and so it can provide co-benefits at the same time that it sequesters carbon and it doesn't require us to use more land. Um, and uh, it, it, part of any bill uh, such as Senator Bruns and Young should include increased funding for, for agroforestry research and, uh, and development. Uh, and then finally, we need robust funding for other carbon removal approaches. Uh, there are some that are more technological uh, in, in nature. There's something called direct air capture, which essentially uses large filters to bring in ambient air separate out the carbon dioxide and then seek to store the carbon dioxide underground or use the carbon dioxide for other products. Um, a lot of times we talk about trees because it feels like a more natural sort of solution, right? We, we become squeamish when we're talking about uh, using metal and, and concrete and things like that to create solutions. But but the thing that needs to be emphasized is that natural is not always natural, right? Um, tree planting at the kind of scales we're talking about is ul ultimately likely to m more fundamentally undermine nature than some of these technological approaches. So we need to be looking at things like direct air capture. We need to be looking at uh, things uh, such as enhanced mineral weathering, the idea that we grind up minerals that take up carbon dioxide. They're rich in silicate and, and manganese. And by grinding those up, we accelerate the natural process that takes up carbon dioxide. Um, and in some cases, we may be able to utilize minerals uh, and apply them to crops in ways that provide co-benefits for, uh, for farmers in terms of crop yields. And so uh, we need a, a, a robust research program in the United States and globally uh, to look at the potential benefits of those approaches. Um, and so uh, with that, I'll, I'll conclude and, and, and simply say that uh, uh, trillion trees sounds like a good idea, uh, but it really needs to be scrutinized in, in terms of science and justice in a way that it helps us to address climate change while not exacerbating some of the other kinds of problems that I talked about. Thank you. Thank you, Will.
Thank you so much for being with us today and sharing some thoughts on the Trillion Trees Initiative. A lot to think about there. We have time for a few moments of questions, um, but will you be able to stay with us a few minutes after you we bet. close the program? Absolutely. Okay. Um, who has the first question? Jim Sims? Hi. Can you hear me? Yeah, I can. Good, good. Thank you, Mr. Burns, for the presentation. Um, I um, do a little bit of work uh, with local um, political and community work. Um, and with your talk today on, on planting trees, um, but then there's one thing that you said that, that captured my attention. That was, that's not the entire story. Um, there are other elements. Um, electrification, I think you mentioned, um, robust funding, more efficient usages of fuel. I'm assuming that's fossil fuel. Mm -hmm. um, but one of the things that concerns me is the global aspect um, or national or just much larger aspect. And if you have a community that is doing or trying to do the best they can with um, climate change issues, but you're not in total collaboration with that region or the area around you, um, how effect, effective are those individual? I mean, I know it'll help some, but overall, how effective is that if there's not a broader um, agreement or reach uh, on attaining that goal? Yeah, yeah. I mean, we, we clearly need to be doing this uh, nationally. Um, a lot of times, if a state is trying to do the right thing, let's say a state wants to uh, uh, tell power plants in its area that they have to reduce their emissions, the, the threat to the state uh, is that the, the power plant or an industry will move elsewhere. Right, uh, there'll always be a state that'll say, "Just come on in and do, you know, just party like it's 1999." Right, uh, <laughs> and and that's that's a, that's a threat, right? And so you need a national approach that stops that from happening, you know. Plus, if you have a factory uh, uh, that's that's uh, polluting and it simply moves to another state, right? You're not. It, it, the greenhouse gases are still going to end up in Indiana ultimately, right? And the impacts are going to happen, right? So, you, you 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 need you need the national approach. One of the reasons, though, that the local approach I think is important is beyond the fact that, as you, as you said, Jim, it makes some difference, right? And if you aggregate, right, a, a, a billion Bloomingtons, it, it can make a difference, right? But the other thing that it does is it it helps to um, convince people that we need to address this issue. And that can translate into people uh, communicating that to policymakers, right? And that really matters. Um, it, what political scientists tell you is, is if you look at the average politician, uh, they don't care what you think about an issue unless it's an issue that you will either vote them in office for or out of office for. Right. The fancy term for it is issue saliency. Right. And we, we know what some of those issues are. Right. Uh, guns. Right. The economy, abortion. Right. These are hot button sort of issues that politicians take attention to because they know uh, that their careers live and die by it. Right. Most of the time uh, they just kind of chuckle about climate change because they know that people aren't going to vote for them or against them. Uh, on, on that basis. Uh, but if people start working at the local level on climate change issues, uh, I think they, they put more skin in the game uh, and they start to communicate that it's more important to politicians. Politicians take note and, and you'll start seeing uh, national legislation, right? You know, and, and we need it and we need bipartisan sort of efforts, right? You know, uh, one of the things I want to emphasize is, is, you know, I applaud the fact that your two senators who are Republicans from a conservative state are, you know, trying to work, acknowledging that climate change is happening and are working on a solution, right? It, it may not be all of it, but it's, 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 it's a good thing. So uh, the more we can tell politicians, compliment them for doing that and punishing them, when they don't do that, uh, the more likely we'll get uh, national efforts on top of the local efforts. Thank you. We need to close our program briefly, but as we said, we will return right after with some more questions for Will. Okay, um, <clears throat> in honor of your presentation today, we will be giving a donation to Monroe County United Ministries. So oh. thank you for being here. And 
Next week, April 27th on Zoom, we'll hear from Marjorie Hershey with the filibuster and the Biden agenda, what's happening now. So tune in. And Natalie, let's have our four-way test that so we can close our meeting together. If we can. If we can. I think we might know the four-way test without having to see the graphic. Do we want to test it? Yes, test it. <laughs> okay. Of the things first is it the truth. Second, is it fun? Hey, look at that. We remembered without having to see this. <laughs> okay. Um, Jim Bright, did you want to ask your question? You were up next. Uh, yeah, thank you, Ashley. Um, Will, my question is, uh, do you know if Senators Braun <clears throat> and Young are aware of some of the uh, concerns that you've raised about the uh, Trillion Tree effort? Yeah, that's a good question. I. I can communicated with uh, with uh, via email with uh, with uh, one of their aides, uh, but never never heard anything back. Uh, that may mean they they know. It may mean they don't know. Uh, I uh, I'm not certain. Uh, you know, it's it's a tough question. I think for Pauls sometimes because uh, once once they have to start looking at at some of this other stuff, uh, uh, it. Uh, it makes it more difficult, right? In some ways, to 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 achieve these goals, and sometimes politicians don't want to do that, right? There's a there's willful ignorance. Uh, sometimes it is just a matter of of being able to engage with them, but you have to figure out uh, the, the effective way to do that, um, and it's not always immediately obvious. So, good question. So I was just wondering if if you were to advise them. Would you be able to say, well, we can do a trillion tree initiative if, or would you be saying the trillion tree initiative is not going to get the results you want? I would say that we probably can't sustainably do a trillion trees. It's just, it, it, it would require so many eco, uh, sensitive ecosystems being cleared uh, that, uh, uh, that it's too ambitious uh, and whatever level we're doing it at, we're going to need uh, more sort of monitoring for some of the things that I'm talking about, like permanence. Uh, we're going to have to ensure that we're not displacing agricultural lands and just releasing carbon in other areas. Yeah. It's going to need more of a, of a scientific monitoring uh, body uh, than is contemplated uh, in, uh, in, in the bill currently. I have a question. Hold on a second. Uh, Amy Elstein was actually next. She had a, a question from the sure. chat. I'll make sure we go in order. So yeah, um, my question is kind of tangential, but it's about how farmer changing farming practices can improve uh, carbon sequestration, specifically reducing tilling. Yeah. Yeah, it's a it's a tr it's a tricky question uh, from a scientific standpoint. Uh, there are some studies that say that either no till or low till uh, uh, alternatives uh, can sequester substantial amounts of carbon. There's some other studies that say that whereas it sequesters more carbon in the top layer. Uh, more carbon is released in lower layers, and as a consequence, you might not get uh, much of a benefit from it, right? So I think that there needs to be more uh, research done in this context. Uh, if we're going to do that, we also are going to have to provide uh, uh, incentives for farmers, right? Because it's expensive to convert. You need new equipment. Uh, there's some risks in terms of reducing crop yields. And as we know, farmers live right on the margin a lot of times, right? Um, so 
uh, we are going to have to provide uh, uh, substantial amounts of, uh, of funding uh, in form of carbon credits or, or direct subsidies to, uh, to farmers to, uh, uh, to be able to even experiment with these things. But uh, it's definitely worth looking at. Uh, if, uh, if we can provide farmers with additional sources of income and increase their resilience, um, and also from a political standpoint, uh, develop alliances with groups that sometimes are afraid of climate policy being something that can hurt them economically, it's a good thing. Alon Barker was up next with a question. Okay, um, a quick question. You know, I'm, I'm struck by this tension between uh, you know curative approaches that would just seem very sort of first world. You know, oh, we've got the science, we've got the ideas, we've got the you know let's go and plant all these eucalyptus trees all over the world, to a more preventative approach, which is sort of recognizing ecology, recognizing natural environments, and leaning into the preservation and you know, I'm thinking of the rainforests, for instance, you know, mm -hmm. which are being decimated and having a, a very substantial impact on, um, you know, on, 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 on the whole issue of, of carbon, carbon retention. Um, and so I'm just wondering what your view is as a, as a scientist of the orientation of our understanding to the, to the problem, you know, what, where, where should we be putting our energy? Should it be towards these curative approaches or should we be really thinking about a more sort of, um, preservationist approach. I don't, you know, do you know what I mean? It's, it's sort of yeah. like the difference between the two. Yeah. Um, I mean, at this point, we don't have the luxury of not doing both, unfortunately, right? We're at, we're at such a critical uh, threshold in terms of, uh, in terms of getting to two degrees and beyond uh, that we probably need to be doing both. But clearly what we aren't doing enough is looking at the preservation side, right? You're absolutely right. There's been a massive increase in deforestation in the Amazon under, under the new Bolsonaro regime in the last four or five years. Uh, there's lots of studies that indicate that if we uh, worked to, uh, to uh, uh, protect our current stands of trees more than we do now, or allow these trees to um, uh, to st uh, to stay uh, standing for longer, uh, we might get more of a carbon benefit than uh, than planting more trees, right? And so that that should be a focus. So, you know, I think we want to look at at planting trees in areas where it makes sense, but we definitely need more uh, 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 what they call proforestation. Uh, policies to protect what what we what we have, uh, but that's that's a it's a major challenge, right? You you look at areas like uh, like Brazil, a lot of that uh, deforestation uh, is is to uh, do things like plant soy to meet European markets needs, right? Mm -hmm. uh, so uh, it, it, it's uh, it's everybody's problem. Um, and and we've got to figure out how to create incentives uh, that uh, uh, that that change uh, what what drives people to do those things. Thanks very much, Charlotte. Uh, it's your turn okay, in the question. Okay, thank you, thank you. Uh, my question is about land land use management, and where and the things that are happening out here. For example, in Indiana, we're just. De 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 decimating our wetlands with, with recent legislation. And we're, we're also finding very rich agricultural land being covered by, by um, residential developments. And I'm wondering what, whether Midwestern universities maybe, or whether there are any universities or groups that are doing serious studies on this that, that could be helpful. Yeah. Yeah, there are. I mean, you know, the the problem that you have in a, a lot of times in terms of the loss of these natural areas is that for a long time in America, what we've d done is we've driven decisions by what we call cost benefit analysis, right? Yeah. So we look at the the benefits, and the problem is is that if let's say you're filling in a um, a wetland uh, to uh, create a shopping mall, right? Uh, the benefits are pretty easy to quantify, right? There's increased tax revenue. There's some jobs, right? Uh, 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 in the in the in the mall, there's jobs to construct the mall. When you're looking at the um, risks associated with it, they're much harder to quantify, right? What 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 is the uh, 
uh, uh, economic uh, benefit of a wetland, right? And uh, we do some of that. We have uh, uh, calculations of what we call ecosystem services, right? What what services are those uh, uh, wetlands providing us in terms of water filtration or or carbon uptake and so forth? But those are often uh, not quantified uh, uh, very well, and we need more uh, sophisticated um, uh, analysis to be able to do that, so that we can ensure that when we do these cost benefit analysis. Uh, we're clearly looking at the cost more uh, than, than we are now. Um, the other thing that we need uh, that is uh, is more wonky than that even is is something called a, a real social cost of carbon, right? Okay. So, so you know, social cost of carbon is what is the um, what's the climate uh, cost uh, associated with releasing carbon dioxide. Um, the previous administration said that the cost per ton of carbon uh, to society was like $5, okay? Um, and that's, that's simply not, not true, right? If you look at the losses associated with climate change, uh, violent weather events, uh, heat-related deaths, uh, 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 increases in disease and so forth, the social cost of carbon is probably more like $100 uh, a ton right, of CO2 that's released. And the reason we need to know what those actual costs are is that if we can incorporate those costs into decision-making, uh, then uh, we, it'll, it, it'll encourage industry, uh, if you're imposing those costs on them, to reduce their emissions uh, far more than they are. And it'll tell us that preserving wetlands is far more important than we thought it was vis-a-vis you know, some of the development practices that we're talking about. Uh, and everybody should be able in some ways to agree that with that, both conservatives and liberals. Um, uh, conservatives often talk about the need for a free market, right? And, and let the market decide uh, how we're going to proceed. Well, if the market's going to do that, it needs accurate information about what the implications of their decisions are. And that has to include what the, the climate implications are of putting huge amounts of, of these greenhouse gases in the atmosphere. And the social cost of carbon is our way of doing that. Um, and so the Biden administration has been talking about a social cost of carbon of about $35 or $40 per ton. It's probably still not accurate, right? So we, we need scientists and economists to be uh, working on that with policymakers so that we know what the real implications of, of our activities are. And that might help tilt that balance in terms of, you know, preserving Indiana prairie lands and, and wetlands and things like that more than are happening now. Great, thank you. Um, Bill, did you want to share anything from your comment in the chat? Yes, uh, there is a bill in the Senate uh, Indiana Senate 373 that requires the State Department of Agriculture and the Department of Natural Resources in cons consultation with Purdue University, Utility Regulatory Commission, that's others, to study and make findings recommending uh, potential role of the state in voluntary carbon credit market, and then issue a report to the General Assembly. Um, I guess that's not really a question. It's indicating that state is looking at a potential carbon market for sequestration. I guess if there's a question there from me, it would be, how do you make sure that the cost of carbon is accurately represented and that if people are getting credit for that, uh, who is policing that credit and who's certifying that? Yeah. Well, that's always a big question. There are a number of, of private companies that have popped up in recent years that do certification uh, because you have companies like Microsoft, for example, that are now saying we're going to be net zero in emissions by 2050, right? And part of the way that they're getting there um, is by purchasing carbon credits from like tree planting and, uh, and, uh, and other kinds of programs. And so you now have verifiers uh, that seek to ensure that uh, that those those credits uh, have integrity, right? Uh, you need the same thing when it comes to a, a, a state program, right? They have to assess what the baseline of 
the carbon emissions are in croplands and then estimate uh, what a shift to a different practice would mean in terms of reduction of, of emissions and then provide for a compensation, right? Uh, you need long-term monitoring, right? People sometimes uh, in, uh, change their crop practices, but then they convert them back again, right? Well, you don't want to be giving them credit anymore if that's true, right? Uh, so uh, that's expensive to do, but it's, it's, it's important to do, right? So um, I, I think it's good that Indiana is looking at that because I think, you know, farmers can play a role and anything that can help farmers, uh, you know, increase their resilience is good. Um, and anything that increases uh, bipartisanism, right? I hate to keep going back to this, right? But we're, we're so incredibly right. divided. You yeah. know that in Indiana. Uh, uh, we're so incredibly divided, we can't get anything done, right? So anything that... Uh, both sides of the aisle view as, as potentially beneficial are good. And, and agricultural carbon sequestration is one of those things that, that can provide that kind of common ground. So um, I, I think it's good we're doing it, but it, it is going to be expensive to, to verify and monitor. Thank you. Aaron Davis, your hand was up, I noticed. Thanks. Um, I want to thank you, Will, for the kind and gentle way in which you're approaching all of this. Um, other people will, will say we should call out uh, some of these as scams. Uh, you know, carbon trading, trillion trees, cost benefit analysis. I mean, they're, they're often used to obfuscate the issues and to delay meaningful action. And I come back to the idea of opportunity costs. Mm -hmm. When we go for a quick fix, and it ain't a quick fix, it ain't a fix at all, uh, we're harming ourselves. We're, we're taking away options from the future. So, but I, I do want to say that your approach is excellent. It's disciplined and thoughtful. So thank you very much. Yeah, you're welcome. It, it's, it, it's, a, it's a tough question. You're, you know, you're absolutely right. There's plenty of what we call greenwashing right? Uh, by corporations, by governments, right? You, you name it. Um, and uh, it, it becomes an uneasy balancing act. In some ways, you want to still um, praise uh, these kind of folks when they're even talking about climate change as being real and, and, and indicating they want to engage in it. And at the same time, you want to make sure that it's not BS because you're absolutely right. It's, there's opportunity costs, you know, so it's, it's figuring out where, what that, what that balance is. Um, and it's, it's, it's always, it's always difficult. It's always difficult. Um, Raj, do you have a question? Yes. Professor Byrne, thank you so much for an excellent class you taught most of us today. <laughs> that said, I am torn what I believe and what the reality is. I believe, like most of the medical community, scientific community, what Benjamin Franklin said, one ounce of a prevention worth more than a pound of a treat. Well, the prevention which signed the Paris Agreement, 70 countries, they've been talking about it, and the last study I learned that by the end of the, by the year 2030, there would be all, almost half of 1% of change in the carbon in the environment. Well, that's my big hope. That's my prevention. I'm hanging my hat on. Then you come to what you mentioned about the planting of the trillion trees. Well, mighty great. All of us cheered it until you derail it. So that is all said, is planting a tree, try to take our eye off the ball and switch us to think about something might not produce much either, but it takes the pressure out of the prevention. Help me out if Biden invites you tomorrow. 
So you will burn. I heard you talk so good to the Rotary Club of Bloomington. Would you come and give me a summary what you think I should do? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, there, it's it's a it's a legitimate concern. There there are plenty of people who believe, for example, that if if corporations can you know buy tree credits, right, their their focus on reducing emissions are are going to be uh, are going to decline, right? They call it the the moral hazard, right? Uh, that's a term that comes from insurance companies, where if People have uh, insurance uh, for crop loss, for example. They're not as careful with their uh, with their their crops, right? Uh, and people worry here that if people think that we can uh, simply uh, plant trees or uh, use some of these other carbon removal approaches, they'll take their eye off of trying to decarbonize the economy. Uh, and it's it's a legitimate question. The, the, the problem that we have is, as I said at the beginning, is the science now tells us that we've put so much of this uh, is, uh, of these greenhouse gases into the atmosphere, and we're so structurally committed to putting a lot more in the atmosphere because of the nature of our economy over the century, that we we don't have the option. We both need uh, uh, the uh, uh, the pound of cure. And we need the uh, the penny of prevention uh, simultaneously, right? We need to suck carbon out of the atmosphere, and we need to uh, massively accelerate our transition to a to a virtually no carbon economy. Uh, and it's not going to be easy, but we're we're just going to have to continue to, I think, to drum in the message that that it's not an either or proposition. If, if you put all of your eggs in the basket of removing carbon from the atmosphere and you're not simultaneously reducing, putting more carbon in the atmosphere, we're screwed. Um, but if you don't simultaneously try to take some of the carbon out of the atmosphere at the same time, we're gonna be in lots of trouble also. Uh, that's, that's a challenge to, from a political messaging standpoint, but I, I think it's what the scientific reality is. And I, I wish it wasn't, you know, I, I tell people a lot of times, if this were 1980 or 1970, and we were where we are now in terms of, you know, development of solar and wind and, and, you know, discussions of climate change and recognition by most people that it is a serious issue, we'd get to where we need to be. But unfortunately, you know, we're 40 or 50 years past that, and uh, we, we, we just have very little time left. Uh, uh, it, it, a lot of people think that we're going to get to that 1.5 degrees Celsius uh, mark uh, that the Paris Agreement talks by, by about 2035, right? And we may get to two by 2050, maybe 2040, right? Uh, and so... Uh, we just uh, we don't have the luxury of not trying to throw everything at it. Uh, but you, you're definitely absolutely right. We've got to be careful that uh, people, including politicians, don't say, well, here's a way here's a get out of jail free card, right? Carbon removal. And so we don't have to focus on the other things it, we can't do that. 50 years ago, Richard Nixon created the EPA to deal with this. So yeah. There, so there was a an op, there was an opportunity. What have we done with it? Scoring yeah. It. Yeah, it was a it was a different world. You know, when when we had the first Earth Day, uh, every member of Congress, they took Congress off. Congress adjourned and all of the members of Congress went back to their districts to talk about the environment on that Earth Day, right? Can you imagine that happening now, right? <laughs> Uh, it's a different world, but we got to try to figure out a way, uh, you know, to find more common ground. You know, that's that's why I try to avoid throwing bombs these days, yes. even when I'm very yeah. angry about some of these issues. Right. We, we got to work together. Yeah. <clears throat> Thank you. Any other last comments or questions? I know we've taken a lot of time uh, with you today, but we appreciate okay. you taking extra yeah. time for your question. Very much. Yes, thank you for joining us. And yeah, you're very you. welcome. Thank you. Have a great week. Yeah. It was my thank pleasure. You. Thank you very much. Goodbye, everyone. Thank Goodbye. you. Bye-bye.
Thank you.